General Albert Pike and the Conspiracy. Fully cognizant with the fact that telling the truth will hurt many people, and anger those who serve the devil's purpose, we still feel it is necessary to give the public proof that General Albert Pike lived a dual life. The fact that so little is known regarding his secret, private life isn't to be wondered at. The synagogue of Satan are sons of the father of lies, Lucifer. Those who control and direct the Luciferian conspiracy on this earth are masters of deceit. For this reason, those who have constituted the SOS down through the centuries have been represented to the masses as great patriots, great philanthropists, great Gentiles, great Jews. When history or research proves they had Jekyll and Hyde personalities, we call them idols with feet of clay. People the SOS use to further their secret plans are built up as public personages so they can better influence the minds of their public. The present practice of deification of everyone who is connected with Hollywood illustrates perfectly what I mean. Actresses are given parts depicting them as being as promiscuous as the proverbial mink. This is Satanism in action. The purpose behind this is to break down the morals of the younger generation. If it is right for their idols to live, modern and have sexual intercourse with every man who takes their fancy, the teenagers are led to believe there is no sin involved in living modern also. Parents and ministers who say differently are branded silly and old-fashioned. Those who direct the WRM at the top say, the best revolutionary is a young person absolutely devoid of morals. Hidden history proves that General Albert Pike is one of those men for whom the Holy Scriptures tell us to watch out. In Matt 24 24, Mark 13 22, 14 56, etc., we are told false prophets and false Christs shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Documentary evidence proves that Pike was not only a false Christ, he was, before he died, the high priest of the Luciferian ideology on this earth, and as such, controlled the synagogue of Satan. His military blueprint called for three world wars, and three major revolutions, to bring wise help to revised version of the age-old Luciferian conspiracy to its final stage. In the 1860s he is recorded as saying his military program might take 100 years or a little longer to reach the day when those who direct the conspiracy at the top will crown their leader king despot of the entire world and impose a Luciferian totalitarian dictatorship upon what is left of the human race. When Weishaupt organized the Illuminati 1776-1784 to put his revised and modernized version of the Luciferian protocols into effect, he and his associates are recorded as discussing whether they should use Christianity, Judaism, Freemasonry, or atheism as a cloak under which to hide their secret plans and activities. This was much the same decision the Kaiser leaders had to make when they set out to conquer Europe 300 AD. Those who directed the Kaiser invasions into southeastern Europe decided to force Talmudism on those they led and conquered, in preference to Mohammedanism or Christianity. They therefore used anti-Mohammedanism and anti-Christianity as emotions to serve their evil purpose. Weishaupt and his Illuminati decided to benefit by the lessons history had taught in this regard. They decided to use all four of these religions to cloak their evil purposes and further their own secret plans and diabolical ambitions. Weishaupt decided that the Illuminati would infiltrate into Freemasonry because it was a secret society wherein members could be bound by oath not to divulge anything they might hear or learn. Even the apprentices, the very beginners are required to swear, in the name of the supreme architect of all the world, I, name, will never reveal the secrets, signs, touches, words, doctrines 
or customs of the Freemasons, and will maintain above all an eternal silence concerning them. I promise, and I swear to God, not to reveal anything by pen, signs, words, or gestures, and never to have written, lithographed, printed, or published anything which has been confided to me up to now and may be confided henceforth. I bind myself and I submit to the subsequent punishment if I fail to keep my word. May they burn my lips with a red hot iron, may they cut off my hand, and my neck, and snatch out my tongue, may my corpse be hanged in the lodge during the admission of a new brother so that it may serve as a stigma of my infidelity, and an object of horror to the rest. May it be burned afterwards and the ashes cast to the wind so that no trace remain of the memory of my treachery. Thus may God and his holy gospel help me. So be it, Eckert Volume. I, pages 33-34, we publish the oath only to prove that the lower degree Masons honestly and sincerely believe they are joining a secret society to further the cause of God and help their fellow men as God commanded. When initiated they unselfishly intend to fulfill this duty to the limit of their ability and resources. The vast majority of 32nd and 33rd degree Masons do not know, or even suspect, that at the VERYTOP, beyond the reach of all except those specially selected is the Synagogue of Satan, controlled by high priests of the Luciferian Creed. Weishaupt was quite implicit in his instructions that Masonic lodges are only to be used as places in which the Illuminati could organize a secret society within a secret society. He made it perfectly clear that the purpose of infiltration was to place Illuminists in position so they could contact men of high social standing and proven ability in business, the arts, professions, and politics, etc. The Illuminati then used their power and influence to, page 65 Satan, Prince of this world placed their agent Ur in key positions in all levels of society and fields of human endeavor. The ordinary members were to be used only for promoting the idea of one world government and one world religion. The masters of the seat wanted to use Masonic philanthropy simply to cover their diabolical purpose and to give their agents an air of respectability. The lesson to be learned is this. No Christian should swear to maintain secrecy unless he has full knowledge of what the oath of secrecy involves. To promote God's intentions, we must make them known. Those who promote Luciferianism keep their plans and objective secret. The following is the frontispiece of a book written by Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry Prepared for the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree for the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States and published by its authority on the back of the frontispiece is, entered according to Act of Congress, in the year 1871, by Albert Pike, in the office of the Librarian of Congress, at Washington, D.C. entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1905, by the Supreme Council of the Southern Jurisdiction, A. A. S. R. USA, in the office of the Librarian of Congress, at Washington, D.C. We quote from Chapter XXX, Knight of Kadosh, page 819, The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand time, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry the whole body of the royal and sacerdotal art was hidden so carefully, centuries since, in the high degrees as that it is even yet impossible to solve many of the enigmas which they contain. It is well enough for the mass of those called Masons, to imagine that all is contained in the blue degrees, and whose attempts to undeceive them will labor in vain, 
and without any true reward violate his obligations as an adept. Masonry is the veritable sphinx, buried to the head in the sands heaped round by the ages. The book this was obtained from bears. This publisher's name, L.H. Jenkins, Incorporated, Richmond, Virginia, May 1920. The manner in which Illuminus infiltrated into the lodges of the Scottish Rite located throughout the world is best illustrated by telling the life story of General Albert Pike. This story reveals how professors who are of the Illuminati select exceptionally brilliant students and indoctrinate them into one form or another of internationalism. They then use them to serve those who direct the Luciferian conspiracy. Pike's life also illustrates how those who direct the world revolutionary movement at THETOP obtain control of high-ranking officers in the armed forces of their respective countries. I solemnly declare that until 1957, I knew only the side of Pike's life story which showed him to be a great scholar, a clever lawyer, a brave soldier, a fervent Christian, and all in all, a great American patriot. I did not even mention his name in connection with the World Revolutionary Movement in the first editions of Pawns in the Game or the Red Fog over America. My belief regarding General Albert Pike prior to 1957 was that of literally millions of other people, particularly Freemasons, in every country of the world. But quite by accident, while studying what was behind the Little Rock incident, I picked up a clue that indicated Albert Pike had lived a double life. Investigations proved he was the greatest drive Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of the 19th century. First I shall give my reader the picture I had of Albert Pike prior to 1957. Albert Pike, American patriot and Christian gentleman General Albert Pike was born in Boston, Mass. December 29, 1809. His parents moved to Newbury, Mass., when Albert was four years old. It was here he grew up. He attended the common schools, but, because he showed exceptional mental ability, he was given a few terms in a private school, and then at the academy in Framingham. His capacity to study and absorb knowledge was so great that he actually started teaching others at page 66 Satan, Prince of this world 15 years of age. At 16 he passed an examination which enabled him to enter Harvard University as a freshman. Because his parents could not afford to pay his tuition fees, Pike taught school in Gloucester during the fall and winter seasons and paid his own way. He qualified for the junior class at Harvard, but because of trouble with the faculty, he left the university and returned home and educated himself. He told his parents and friends that he left Harvard because of a misunderstanding over tuition fees. Upon his return home he taught school in Fairhaven and Newburyport. He became assistant to the principal. Afterwards, for a short time, he became principal of Newburyport Grammar School. He was still in his early twenties. Next, he became headmaster of a private school, serving in this capacity until the end of the spring term of 1831. In the early summer of 1831 he broke away completely from his successful teaching career and started for the West on foot. He traveled, explored, traded, and lived with the Indians. He learned their language and customs. His honesty when dealing with them, his straightforward approach when discussing a problem, or clearing away a misunderstanding, won for him the confidence of the Indians. He settled in Little Rock, Arkansas, in 1833. He became editor of the Arkansas Gazette. He also wrote articles for other publications, including a series of poems for Blackwood's magazine in Edinburgh, Scotland. These were published by John Wilson, the editor in 1838. 
Wilson eulogized Pike as the coming poet in America, whose fine hymns entitled him to take his place in the highest order of his country's poets. His massive genius marks him to be the poet of the Titans. Pike used the money earned as the result of his literacy efforts to educate himself in law. Pike volunteered and served the USA in the war with Mexico. He became a captain of cavalry and served with distinction while participating in the Battle of Buena Vista. He afterwards took 41 men and rode from Saltillo to Chihuahua, a distance of 500 miles, through country infested with bandits and fugitive soldiers from Santa Ana's defeated armies. The city of Mapini surrendered to him while on his outward journey. Pike built an impressive mansion in Little Rock in 1840, which contained 13 rooms. He transferred his law practice to New Orleans in 1851, and practiced before the Supreme Court of the United States. He returned to Little Rock in 1857 and lived there until the outbreak of the Civil War. He was made a Brigadier General in the Confederate Army, and commissioner for negotiating treaties with the Indians whose claims against the United States government he prosecuted afterwards. After the war he resided in Memphis, Tennessee for several years, moving to Washington about 1869, where he resided for the rest of his life. He died April 2, 1891. Pike's advance in Freemasonry was truly extraordinary. According to his daughter, Mrs. Liliana Pike Broom, her father was initiated in the Western Star Lodge at Little Rock, Arkansas in 1850, when 41 years of age. He became Worshipful Master, July of the same year. He was a charter member of Magnolia Lodge No. 60, Little Rock, and was Worshipful Master ad vitam of that lodge in 1853. Prior to this he was, exalted in Union Chapter, NO.2RZ.M. Little Rock, created Knight Templar No. 1 Lodge in Washington, 17.C. He was also elected Grand High Priest of the Grand Chapter of Arkansas in 1853. In 1858 he received from Brother Theodore Satan, Parvin, of Connecticut, the 4th to 32nd degree inclusive in the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, March 20th, 1853. On April 25th, 1857, he was coroneted Hon. Inspector General and crowned active member of the Supreme Council, Southern Jurisdiction, March 20th, 1858 at Charleston, South Carolina. When Brother John Honor resigned as Grand Commander, Albert Pike was elected M.P. Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council for the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States, January 2, 1859. He afterwards became Sovereign Pontiff of Universal Freemasonry. This is Pike's public record and one which justifies Americans looking up to him as an example of real Americanism. But what of his secret record? It was while investigating the Little Rock integration incident in 1957 that I first learned of Pike's rapid advance in Freemasonry, and knowing that Weishaupt, using Thomas Jefferson and Moses Holbrook, had infiltrated Illuminus into the Masonic Lodges of America, I decided I would find out if the fact that Pike's mansion in Little Rock had 13 rooms had any significance. Thirteen figures prominently in satanic, Lucifer Ian and Kabbalistic rituals, codes, and writings, etc. My investigations produced documentary evidence to show that, because of Pike's exceptional mental ability, he came under the notice of professors in Harvard who were members of the Illuminati, who developed in his mind the idea that a one-world government, a one-world religion and a one-world financial and economic system was the only solution to the world's many and varied problems. I next discovered that his departure from Harvard was not due to lack of finances, 
or because of a misunderstanding with the faculty over tuition fees, but because of his radical ideas and teachings, when he returned home determined that he would fight his way to the top despite all opposition, he was in a suitable frame of mind to be recruited as a minor valor apprentice into the lower degrees of the Illuminati. Page 67 Satan, Prince of this world I found that those secretly directing the Luciferian conspiracy in America decided to use Pike's mental capacity, his qualities as a teacher, and his ability to master languages, to further their own secret plans. They tested his physical courage and resourcefulness by sending him among the Indians to earn his living by use of his brains while learning their language and customs. As those fomenting the American Civil War, they could use Pike and his connections with the Indians when they considered the time was ripe for the outbreak of hostilities. Pike came out of this test with full marks and colors flying. He was next required to gain military experience by a period of active service. This is an unbroken principle, and must be complied with by every man who wishes to advance to a position of leadership in the world revolutionary movement. Thousands of American citizens, thousands of British citizens, and over 2,000 Canadians joined Major Atlee's International Brigade and fought in the Spanish Civil War, 1,926-1,929, in order to obtain military experience necessary for a communist to qualify for leadership in the World Revolutionary Movement. The Mexican War provided Pike with just the opportunity he needed. Having proven himself to be a man of exceptional ability, personal courage and leadership, in 1850 Pike was infiltrated into the Scottish Rites of Freemasonry. He again distinguished himself and won the confidence and respect of members. The archives in Washington, D.C. throw some unexpected light on Pike's connections with the Indians during this civil war. These records show that he had first commanded a regiment, and afterwards a brigade of Indian troops, CSA it also discloses the fact the Pikes Indian troops had been disbanded by order of President Jefferson Davis because of the atrocities they had committed under the excuse of conducting legitimate warfare. Investigation into Pikes associates while in Harvard and while teaching private school, proved he had become acquainted with men who were members of the Illuminati, men who were connected with Moses Holbrook, Clinton Roosevelt, Dana, Greeley, etc. There is evidence to indicate that after 1840 Pike's 13-room mansion was used as the secret headquarters of those who constituted the Synagogue of Satan, and that within those walls they practiced occultism and performed satanic rituals, based on the Kabbalism, as used by Moses Mendelssohn when he conducted initiations into the higher degrees of Weishaupt's Illuminati in Frankfurt, Germany prior to 1784. Further light was thrown on this phase of Pike's secret life when research revealed that after Pike gave up living in his little rock mansion, it was occupied by John Gould Fletcher, who also practiced spiritualism and occultism. He won the Pulitzer Prize for his poem written about Pike's mansion entitled, The Ghosts of an Old House. It may be assumed that there is a great deal more truth than poetry in those verses because evidence was later dug up which proved Pike conducted seances in St. Louis and other places throughout the world. It was next discovered that Pike had been intimately associated with Giuseppe Mazzini from 1834 onwards, and remained closely associated with him until he died in 1872. Mazzini had been sent to America to assist Thomas Jefferson in laying the foundations for the part Weishaupt intended America should play in the semi-final stages of the conspiracy. Research into the writings of Mazzini's associates in France and Italy proved that Pike climbed the rungs of the ladder of Illuminism as fast as he had advanced in Freemasonry. Moses Holbrook was secret head of the Synagogue of Satan in America during the first half of the 19th century. 
He used the Kabbalistic rites as taught by Moses Mendelssohn when initiating specially selected candidates into Satanism as practiced in the higher degrees of Grand Orient Masonry in France and Italy by Cremieu and Mazzini respectively. The Kabbalah's Talmudic teachings, i.e., Satanism, was substituted for the books of Moses during the time the Jews, so-called, were captive in Babylon. Because some of the founding fathers of America had been openly anti-Semitic, and because the manner in which Illuminism had been exposed as having infiltrated into American masonry, and because those who directed the activities of the Illuminati were mostly men who called themselves Jews, even if they were not, and lied about the matter, Pike decided that he would pretend to clean jury out of control in America as far as Freemasonry was concerned. We will prove later that we are justified in using the word, pretend. He also decided that because the Illuminati was becoming suspect as directing the WRM he would reorganize Pauladism and established councils throughout the world to take the place of lodges of the Grand Orient and the Illuminati. In other words, Pike decided to set up a different front in order to give the Synagogue of Satan, which directs the WRM at the top, a new face. He was determined to throw historians and research workers off the scent which stank to high heaven after Captain Morgan was murdered. Moses M E N D E L S S O H N apostrophe S's ritual for the higher degrees of Grand Orient M A S O N S was known as the Black Mass. Its words and ceremonies expressed bitter hatred of Christ and Christianity. Pike suggested to Moses Holbrook that it would be a good idea if they revised and modernized the ceremony of the Black Mass so that it didn't appear so Talmudic. Holbrook agreed and worked with Pike on a new ritual. Holbrook died before the task was completed, and Pike completed the work alone. He called the new ceremonial, the Adonai Aside Mass, which means, the death of God. It was on Pike's doctrine that Nietzsche, page 68 Satan, prince of this world in Germany based his ideas and theories calculated to bring about, the death of God, so Lucifer can reign in peace and security. We know these theories as Nietzscheism. We have referred to the writings of Domenico Margiata on many occasions when dealing with the manner the Illuminati infiltrated into Freemasonry because Margiata was a 33rd degree Mason before he seceded. He did not quit Masonry until after he had been selected for initiation into the higher degrees of Grand Orient Masonry and or the new and reformed Paladian Rite. He gives as his reason for refusing to be initiated, that the study of the lives of those who wished to initiate him convinced him they were Satanists. We have Margiata's word for it that Grand Master Pike re-established the supremacy of his Supreme Council and succeeded gradually in becoming an important Masonic personage, and the real chief of the Scottish Rite. As a 33rd degree Mason and sovereign pontiff of universal Masonry, Pike traveled the world. Masonic libraries reveal he was honorary Grand Commander of the Supreme Councils of Brazil, United, Egypt, Tunis, France, Belgium, Italy, Spain, England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, Greece, Hungary, New Valgrand, Canada, Colon, Peru, Mexico, Uruguay, and Bochiana. But what the Masonic libraries do not reveal is the fact that while pretending to be traveling on business concerning the Scottish Rite, Pike was actually establishing 26 councils of the new and reformed Paladian Rite, which he superimposed on the Grand Orient Masonry. Grand Orient Masons worship Satan as prince of this world. Satan is their god. Paul Addison recognized Satan as prince of this world. But, according to the Lucifer Ian doctrine as expounded by Pike, Lucifer is God, the equal of Adonai, and rules over all that part of the universe not included in Adonai's part which we term heaven. 
Pike stated that Satanism is to be tolerated among imperfect members. Imperfect members are all members of Grand Orient Lodges and Councils of the New and Reformed Polydian Rite who haven't been initiated into the final degree and made acquainted with the full secret. Perfect members are exceedingly few in number. But Pike insisted that those selected for initiation into the full secret accept Lucifer as their god and worship him as the god of goodness and the god of light from whom all knowledge and intelligence originates. Pike, himself, and the ritual of the Adonai Aside Mass specifically condemn Lucifer's opponent as Adonai, the god of Elel evil and the god of darkness. Dom Paul Benoit made a special study of Pike's new and reformed Polydian Rite, and on page 456 of volume, I have his book, Le France McCannery, he says, in the reception of the elect of the reformed Polydian Rite, those who are to be initiated are taught to punish the traitor Jesus Christ and to kill Adonai, Adonai, the God of the Bible, and Father of Jesus Christ, through the power of their own evil, done first by master and then by initiate, piercing the host with a dagger, in the midst of horrible blasphemies, after they have been assured that it, the host, is a consecrated host. Dom Benoit also says that in 1894, 800 consecrated hosts were stolen from a church in Paris to be used by the sectarians for their abominable mysteries, and that the truth of this statement was verified. I realized how difficult it is for the average decent person, regardless of race, color, or creed, to realize that Satanism is actually practiced, and that the synagogue of Satan is controlled at the top by human beings who are the high priests of the Lucifer Ian Creed who plot to enslave what remains of the human race after the final social cataclysm is ended. Therefore, I shall quote Pike's own words as recorded by Arthur Proust on pages 157 8 of volume. I, a study in American Freemasonry. While Pike was explaining why those directing the WRM at the top intended to use international communism as their manual of destructive action, Proust quotes him as saying, There is a merely informal atheism, which is the negation of God in terms, but not in reality. A man says, There is no God. That is, there is no God WHO originates in himself, WHO ever was originated, but a God who always was and has been, who is the cause of existence, who is the mind and the providence of the universe, and therefore, the order, beauty, and harmony of the world of matter and mind do not indicate any plan or intention of divinity, but nature that is powerful, wise, active and good, nature originated within itself, or perhaps, it always was and has been, the cause of its own existence, the mind of the universe and its own providence. Clearly there is a plan and purpose from which proceed order, beauty, and harmony. But this is the plan and purpose of nature. In such matters the absolute negation of God is only formal and not real. The qualities of God are recognized, and they affirm his existence. It is a mere change of name to call the possessor of these qualities nature and not God. The word nature, as used by Pike, means the sum total of existence, exactly as the word universe means the totality of everything within and without space, including everything in and on this earth. Pike is also recorded as saying that atheistic communism will be only a passing phase in the overall revolution, and as is mentioned elsewhere Pike told Mazzini exactly how communism and Christianity were to be made to destroy each other in an all-out war with each other in order to usher the Luciferian conspiracy into its final stage. It is only when we dig down deep and look behind the curtains of Pike's life that we realize that when talking of God and or nature he was really meaning Lucifer. We have said Thomas Jefferson became a member of Weishaupt's Illuminati. 
regardless of what Americans have been taught to believe about Thomas Jefferson as a Christian and a patriot, the fact remains that he did. Page 69 Satan, Prince of this world played a leading part in bringing about Weishaupt's plan which required that America be separated from the British Empire. Therefore he was a traitor to his mother country. He became a traitor because Illuminism had convinced him that only a one-world government, managed by men of brains, could solve the world's problems and end wars and revolutions. He felt he was justified in helping destroy Britain and her empire in the interests of world peace. Exactly the same principles and feelings caused President Ed. Roosevelt to tell Winston Churchill, Britain's Prime Minister, when they met on an American battleship in Agencia Bay, Newfoundland, in the summer of 1942, to discuss the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, it is time the British Empire was dissolved in the interests of world peace. Very few people seem to realize that NATO was organized so that those who direct the WRM at the top could contain the terrible destructive force of communism, which they had created in accordance with Pike's plan, until they wished to use it to usher in the final stage of the Luciferian conspiracy. A slip of the tongue may go unnoticed by millions, but to a historian it may disclose a great deal. Early in World War II Winston Churchill made one of his most famous speeches after he had dined well if not too wisely. There is an old saying, when liquor is in the truth comes out on this particular occasion Churchill said, I will shake hands with the devil himself if by so doing he will help me defeat that, Hitler. Here we get a glimpse of the truth. If Churchill had been a God-loving and God-fearing person it would have been only natural that he would have spoken the name of God, and not that of Lucifer. Exactly the same line of reasoning explains many of the political actions of Mackenzie King during the quarter century. He was Prime Minister of Canada. He was indoctrinated into internationalism while he was going to the university. His record as a young man is very similar to that of Pike. He was openly a radical, and the true descendant of his rebellious grandfather. He was so utterly ruthless and unscrupulous when in Toronto University that he was heartily disliked by the vast majority of his fellow students. But once he sold his soul to the Rockefellers, he directed the Canadian government's policies so they fitted in with Lucifer Ian Plot to bring into being a one-world government. And the masses, the Goyim, are so thoroughly brainwashed by the Luciferian propaganda machine that the people of Canada kept re-electing him Prime Minister, although his treachery as far as Britain and the rest of her Commonwealth Empire was concerned, had been proven to the hilt in letters he wrote early in the First World War to prominent Americans who were friends of the Rockefellers, or obligated to them for financial favors and asked them to use their influence with the American government so that financial and other aid would be withheld from Britain and France, and so prolong the war and seriously weaken the British Empire. The control of the SOS has, over the so-called free and independent press is such that even as a professional journalist and author of many books, I couldn't get the truth regarding Mackenzie King and his treachery and occultism over to the public until I published Red Fog Over America privately in 1955. It was Thomas Jefferson who had the Illuminatus symbol secretly engraved on the reverse side of the Great Seal of America. It was his intention that its presence remain a secret until America should disintegrate due to internal trouble and strife and fall into the hands of those who direct the WRM at the top, like overripe fruit, and introduce the New Order. We have explained that the words New Order are double talk for Luciferian dictatorship, and used to deceive the general public into accepting the idea of a one-world government. Ed. Roosevelt was so sure he would introduce the New Order that he started his presidential reign by introducing his New Deal, 
which was a version of dictatorship intended to be developed into totalitarianism as soon as the time was ripe. He, Roosevelt, was so sure he was going to be the first king despot of the entire world that he brought the Illuminati symbol, the satanic coat of arms, out of mothballs and used it on the back of American dollar bills. He thus assured all those in the know that the Luciferian conspiracy was about to enter the final stage. The fact that Stalin double-crossed him after Yalta is the only thing that prevented his dreams from coming true. Instead of becoming the first king despot, he went insane. The reason the public wasn't permitted to see his face before his body was buried was, I am informed by good authority, because there was no face to see. He is said to have ended his hate against Stalin, his disappointments and misery of mind and soul, with the shotgun. When we revealed the truth that the symbol of the Illuminati was on the back of the United States $1 bills, it caused consternation among those who direct the WRM at the top. They immediately commissioned some of Hollywood's best writers to interpret the symbols as being of great patriotic meaning. If this lame effort to kill the truth was correct then why was the fact that the symbol was on the reverse side of the great seal kept so secret from Jefferson's date to that of Roosevelt? The power, the cunning, and the deceit of those who serve the SOS can be better understood when we explain that according to Weishaupt's own interpretation of the symbol the pyramid represents the plot to bring about the destruction of Christendom. To deceive the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church into believing that they were not marked down for destruction also, the agent Euro of Weishaupt's organization made it appear their only hate was against Catholicism and not against Christ and Christianity in general. Such is the power and influence of the SOS that they caused the priests who direct the youth departments of Catholic action to, page 70 Satan, Prince of this world published the Hollywood writer's version of the meaning of the symbol and they published it far and wide and urged Catholics to accept Satan's version as the version despite historical facts and documents which expose the Hollywood version as a deliberate lie. When the truth was explained to the priests responsible, they could not do anything to correct their mistake because they had acted under orders of higher authority. This indicates that the SOS have their agent Ur within the hierarchy of Roman Catholicism just as they had Judas among Christ's own apostles. For many years I have known that men who have directed the WRM at the very top used the game of chess to symbolize their march of peaceful progress towards ultimate world domination. In their chess game one player represents God, the other the devil, Lucifer. Pawns represented the masses or Goyim. The gods sacrifice as many of the pawns as is necessary to enable them to kill off the knights, bishops, and castles, and queens, and make one or the other king checkmate. It was because I knew that chess symbolized the struggle to bring about a one-world government under a totalitarian dictator that I named one of my books, Pawns in the Game, and another one, Dealing with Nazism, Checkmate in the North, published by Macmillan in 1944. But it wasn't until November, 1958, while writing this chapter, of this book, that I learned by accident, or, an act of God, that Albert Pike owned an extremely rare set of chess men copied from the originals. Part of the chessmen belonging to his set were taken from his home when a detachment of the 2nd Kansas Cavalry raided Little Rock in the summer of 1863. When the raiders distributed their loot, Pike's chessmen fell into the hands of Captain E. S. Dover, of Company B. After the war, he moved to New Mexico and became Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Scottish Rite Masons. In 1915, when Stover was over 80 years of age, he had Pike's chess men placed with other relics of Pike in the library of the Supreme Council then, from an entirely different source, 
I received a copy of Susan Lawrence Davis's Authentic History of the Ku Klux Klan, 1865-1877, published by the American Library Service, New York, 1924. The author gives a detailed account of General Albert Pike, and as much of his activities as the general public is intended to know. But the old, old saying, murder will out applies to the Lucifer Ian conspiracy, mass murder, as it does to individual homicide. Susan Davis just happens to mention that the chess men which belonged to Pike were identical with a set with which she had played with General Forrest when she was a little girl. Susan Davis says she when General Forrest used to play a game he called Make believe these are the very words Weishaupt used when telling Luminous how they should act. This scrap of information wouldn't mean anything at all as far as the world revolutionary movement is concerned, if it weren't for the fact that General Forrest originated and organized the Ku Klux Klan, and, at a convention of the KKK held in Nashville, Tennessee, USA, Forrest May Pike, who had organized the KKK in Arkansas, Grand Dragon of the Realm Pike was also appointed Chief Judicial Officer of the Invisible Empire. It was Pike who advised the leaders of the KKK to memorize their secret ritual and pass it down from leader to leader so a copy would never fall into hostile hands. General Pike appointed Henry Fielding and Epi Fielding of Fayetteville, Arkansas, to assist him in organizing Dens in Arkansas. The Fieldings had been original members of the Athens, Alabama clan until they moved to Arkansas in 1867. History, as generally taught in American schools and colleges, doesn't put much importance on the fact that the political, religious, and racial strife now rife in Arkansas and other southern states is only a repetition of what went on in Arkansas during the dark days of Reconstruction following the Civil War. General Albert Pike was the secret power who directed what was going on from behind the scenes in Arkansas, as is proven by what is published on page 277 of the authentic history of the Ku Klux Klan. Few people with whom I have discussed this matter seem aware of the fact that Arkansas had two governments in 1872, and that great excitement prevailed. Public opinion was so much against what Washington was doing that civil war threatened, until Albert Pike called a mass meeting. With dramatic effect Pike unfurled the stars and stripes and with great eloquence, he appealed to the people gathered in the Capitol building to be patient, and follow this flag until the Ku Klux Klan can redeem the state. He promised that he would go personally to Washington and intercede on their behalf. This promise he kept. In view of the events of history since 1872, Pike did what he did because he knew the time for the final social cataclysm wouldn't be ripe for nearly a hundred years. This statement and warning was written into the lectures delivered to members of the councils of his Polydian right between 1885 and 1901. I have had the pleasure of meeting present-day leaders of the KKK. I even had the privilege of addressing some of them and they gave me an attentive hearing while I explained how those who directed the World Revolutionary Movement planned to cause the USA to disintegrate in the final stages of the conspiracy as the result of civil war, combined with a communist revolution. I told them how it was planned to line up Jews against Gentiles, colored folk against white, atheists against Christians, etc., quoting from the letter Pike addressed to Magazine August 15, 1871, to prove that what I told them was the truth, explaining that laws regarding integration were passed to help bring this division about. I pointed out how, in every state south of the Mason-Dixon line, Men and women had appeared from nowhere in particular and immediately worked their way into a position from which they could exert great influence in opposing groups. 
I pointed out that these parvenu always seem to. Page 71 Satan, prince of this world have unlimited sums of money at their disposal, and how they could always arrange a deal to procure arms and ammunition. I told them bluntly that these agents were agent Euro of the Illuminati, and that their purpose was to cause the tensions to develop into strife and bloodshed. The night I addressed one group of leaders the tension was taught as a piano wire, due to the fact that federal government officials had announced that a new building project in a white section of the community was to be integrated. My audience had announced that they would prevent integration by armed force, if necessary. They asked me point blank, what do you expect us to do except integration without a struggle? I replied with another question. I asked, how many white and colored people are there in this community who really want to slit each other's throats and commit atrocities? There was silence. I pointed out that those who controlled the armed forces of the USA had paratroops in strategic locations throughout the country, and planes ready to take them wherever required. It was the middle of the night, and I could hear the tick of an old-fashioned clock. As kindly as I could, I said, I doubt if there are five white or colored men who actually want to involve the whole community in the horrors of civil war. The hour is late literally, in more ways than one. Why don't you leaders of the white section of the population go at once and see the leaders of the colored folk? Tell them you don't want war and bloodshed any more than they do. Ask them, for the sake of all concerned, to tell of the few colored folk, whom the conspirators intend to use as pawns in this experiment, that if they allow themselves to be used thus, the Negroes who don't want trouble with the whites will knock the living daylights out of those who do. Tell them not to allow Negroes to move into the segregated areas. At daybreak, the white leaders met with the Negro leaders. They agreed to do as I requested. No colored people moved into the segregated section. No trouble broke out. Two nights later, I met some of the leaders and told them to watch carefully for those who disagreed with the action they had taken, because those would be the provocateurs of the Illuminati. The agent you of the Illuminati don't lie timidly or for a while only. They lie boldly and continuously, like the devil. They know that if they can deceive the masses into putting them into office, they can do the direct opposite of all promises afterwards. As Voltaire said, that is of no consequence so we have Jefferson carrying the ball for the Illuminati politically for 1786, while Moses Holbrook looked after the dogmatic end of the Luciferian conspiracy in the Americas towards the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries. Since then presidential candidates have been selected and elected by those who direct the conspiracy at the top. The masses have been made to think they elect the men of their own choice, but, in reality, as Weishaupt intended, they are given Hobson's choice. Could anything illustrate this truth more clearly than the last few presidential elections? and the last election fight between Harriman and Rockefeller for the governorship of New York? If a president, or other top-level politician slips into office unexpectedly, he or she has silenced one war or another. Presidents not amenable to control by the agent or of the Illuminati are assassinated. Senators who are uncooperative are either blackmailed, smeared, or liquidated. There are hundreds of cases on record to illustrate exactly what I mean. Lincoln, Kennedy, Forrestal, and McCarthy are just typical examples in America. Lord Kitchener, Chamberlain, and Admiral Sir Barry Domville were typical examples in England. The recent murders in Iraq were all part of the same ruthless and diabolical conspiracy to destroy all governments and religions and to bring about a one-world government, the powers of which the high priests of the Luciferian ideology intend to usurp. Page 72 Satan, Prince of this World 